Okay, guys, welcome back. We, uh, I don't know, Ben, I, we haven't recorded, we haven't sat down in the old kitchen and recorded one for a while, have we? Uh, we've been, we have been, you have, we've, we've had a bit of a backlog of, of them, and we've done some of these Zooms, um, these training consultations that we've been doing and enjoying that, having a lot of fun with that. We've got a few of them to do yet, and then we have, um, couple that have not posted or have they all posted all the zooms have posted all the zooms have posted so there's three maybe yeah three, three or four and so that's been fun i've enjoyed that we are i hope i hope the podcast listener out there right now isn't disappointed in the fact that we broke the the mold of how we've been doing some of these podcasts i don't know that we have a mold to break so um deal with it i guess but and i, I say that kind of jokingly but not because when we started the podcast, it really, first off, I want to thank you for supporting it. Like, I, I'm, I'm, it's a project that we started and then we kind of didn't do it for a while and it was for multiple reasons and then we started doing it again. And then it's probably one of these things where, where I don't know if you're like me, but in life, I get, I start, how I act and what I do is strongly influenced by um what like what i'm into at that point in my life so like if i when i get into stuff i get into them and so i started to listen to podcasts and so then the more i started listening to them the more i recognized probably the value of what it actually was and so i'm not i don't want to spend a lot of time preaching to people that are listening to podcasts about how nice podcast is because you know you're listening to them but it's one of our struggles and challenges is to, to try to help other people understand that like I didn't understand it, if that makes any sense. Like I, I didn't put into the, I didn't put as much into this podcast idea of this podcast until I really recognized that I think podcasts are pretty valuable and can be pretty valuable. I also think there's some that are really not that good. Um, I've listened to lots of them. So on the, uh, to that point, I want to make sure that we're doing it the way I feel is good. I don't want people to listen to this and go, but that wasn't very good. Um, I, our hope is that not only will you continue to listen to it, we hope you subscribe to it, we hope you tell friends about it, um, not just for our sake, but for the sake of the idea of what the podcast represents, and that's to try to help people. So it's a different way of helping. That's the thing that is interesting to me. Video stuff is different than this. We kind of morph this into a little bit of a video thing as well because we do we do try to migrate them to YouTube um, because that's another can of worms that again it's a perfect example of I didn't put we did not put a lot of effort into YouTube because I didn't use YouTube very much personally and so I didn't understand it I didn't realize it's what it was um, you know how it was really built and what it, what it really is good for and how it. There's a lot of there's a lot of really positive things, and I use it a lot more. Consequently, I feel like, man, we need to use this more to help other people with some of the stuff we're doing. So, podcast is a great example of that. So I appreciate the support. Now, the mold part of it is is when we first started out, it, we and, and we've done we change it up, which some people might not like it. I kind of do like it because I feel like. Um, it keeps it more interesting. Sometimes we do updates on some of the projects and stuff that we're doing. We, I've got a question here that I'm gonna read that came from email. I've done a bunch of them that came from Instagram, Facebook, text message, uh, YouTube, all sorts of different ways. And that's the, that's the juggle on our end is trying to keep up with all of it. Um, so we're doing the best we can, but I wanna thank you guys for, for this. And w our mold is never gonna be necessarily defined. We'll prob we've done some lives. Um, we've, we've, we're working with another group that we're gonna do a, um, we're gonna do it through their Instagram. I'll let you know when we get a little bit closer to it, but we're gonna be doing a live Instagram thing. We'll turn it, and we're gonna record it as a Zoom as well, and then we'll use it as a podcast later. And um, so we've done some of that, that stuff. We're gonna we're gonna continue to try to like figure out and test what's the best way to get you the most information. So let's. I, I don't like the beginning of a lot of podcasts because all it is is a commercial and this wasn't a commercial, but uh, maybe it's more giving you some insight into the direction and future of the podcast for us. So let's move on to the next to the to the, the to the meat of this podcast. And it's a question that came from a guy named Ben. I'm answering it because last night I spent two and a half hours responding to 
stuff that I found in my junk mail, questions that I found in my junk mail. So some of you might think I'm not answering. Well, I'm not getting them all sometimes, but uh, I found a bunch of my junk mail that I hadn't checked in a couple, well, it was a couple of weeks and it was lots of them. So I spent a couple hours responding. Also tried playing catch up on some Facebook messaging because I don't get on Facebook our page every day to answer the questions. I don't answer every day on our Instagram. I do some, but it's usually like they're older because I just, I get, we, they pile up. There's a lot of them. So this one I'm going to answer because it's in the, it's in my inbox junk mail and I want to get it. And I'm going to send, instead of typing this one out, I'm going to answer it this way. Send the guy a message, tell him that we got a podcast on it. So it says, he, he, it, first off, it says hello to whoever answers the general inbox general email inbox I had another message that came that said that earlier that said i expect this to probably go to your assistant but as if, if there's anyone that could forward this on to jeremy i had news for her uh there are no assistants around here like the the assistant trainer is me and then the head trainer is me and then the bottom of the barrel trainer is me so there we just we're not a big operation we don't we're not like that so when you send stuff it is getting to me so you can blame me for 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 it uh but so whoever gets this, it came to me. Um, it says, I've got some questions regarding place training. Been using general place training for a few years now as a foundation for retrieving work and steadiness. It's also helped with dogs being crazy when people enter our home. My approach includes sending a dog to place, sometimes from a distance, and expecting them to stay on it until I command them to retrieve or otherwise get off. In my case, even all morning duck sits usually involve some sort of break for the dog and for me to stretch our legs. I'm very curious about how Jeremy and his team use place training at home in the house. It seems like the dogs don't get full roam of the house ever. Is that the case? Or do they occasionally get to romp around? My current pup, 10 weeks old, is doing exceptionally well, staying on place for a couple minutes. But I'm reluctant to force him to stay longer because of my perception of his attention span. Am I underestimating his potential or is there something else you would do with the puppy between kennel time and place time? So there's there's a lot there. Now, so let's go back up to the top. I, this is a this is a um, side note to this, but I'm a little concerned. I I, I love the command place. I don't love the play, the command place so much for my hunting stuff. Um, I do think there's a place for it. I think what we, I had this conversation with a guy the other week. I, I think we have to be very careful because place training is becoming very popular, um, which is awesome. I think it's great. I hope that people, I hope we're part of that reason. Um, I think it's a great skill. It's really remote. It's a remote sit without having a remote sit. So it's, it's, it's having this spot that they have a little bit of freedom to move about a little bit of freedom to get comfortable, a little bit, we're not asking them to sit remotely and, and not move. But we're also recognizing that they're, they are recognizing they are not allowed to get into stuff because of the isolation factor. They're on an island. They're on a spot that they can't get at stuff. As long as you put it in the right spot, they can't get at anything else. So I think there's a lot of, for me, there's a lot more value in that in everyday life than hunting. Now, does place training transfer to hunting? Yeah, it does in a lot of situations because I might be going somewhere and it, there's, I don't need the dog to sit remote and be a statue, but I also don't want the dog to be running around. So do I bring a place stand with me hunting? No, not at all. Um, but I might use something like a stump or I might use something like a piece of concrete or I might use something like I could go anywhere and pick out a lot of things. I, I've picture, I put pictures of my dog sitting on log piles. That's basically place training. Your, your place is that log pile. You can go anywhere you want on that log pile, but you can't come off of it. You can go anywhere you want on that little piece of busted up concrete that's flat and smooth, but you can't come off of it. The, you know, there's all sorts of scenarios, a picnic table. Um, I'm thinking of stuff in my backyard right now, the porch, like I have a, a relatively small deck that comes off. That could be a big place for the dog. So the skill for me is a valuable thing for a dog to understand and keep them out of getting into mischief. I don't like the idea, and I, I, part of this came up because I had a friend send me a message and say, hey, I'm watching these people in the park. They're training their dogs. There's 15 people in the park. It was a class. And they were literally 100% doing everything off of place, place boards. They had like formal place boards. And I said, and it made me start thinking about it. And I thought, 
there literally, I think there literally are programs, which I don't like, I don't like calling anything that we do a program because I just, I just don't think it can be that concrete, but it's a, it's, it's a lot, it's a generalization of understanding how dogs learn and then figuring out how to dial it in specifically for your dog or my dog or this dog or that dog. So we have to be a real adjusting as trainers, not necessarily rigid in following a program. So, but I, I see people talking about programs and I see people more and more, I'm waiting, I mean, maybe that's out there already, but I'm waiting for the place training program that everything we do is built off of a place board. I think it's probably coming if it's not out there already. I am, I am hesitant to say I see issues with it already because what happens when you don't have it? If you create this thing that the dog has to have in order to understand concepts and, and behaviors, then you take that thing away, you just lost all your leverage. So I kind of look at it like treat training. I kind of look at it like avoidance training with a collar. If, if those things have to be there in order for the dog to behave the way we want them to, what happens when you take the things away and the dog reverts and goes back to undesirable behavior? To me, it's incomplete training. So I think the part, I love place boards. I don't want people to say he's anti place board. No, not at all. I use them. I use, I don't use them as place boards though. I use them as elevated cots or beds for my dog. Like I turn around and I've got three of them on beds behind me, two are on one together and one is on one by itself and the other dog is over on the other bed on the other side of the room. So I did not tell him to go there. We, came, we just got done training outside. We came in and I said, I, we set up to do a podcast and the dogs went on their beds and they laid down. It's a behavioral thing. It's a habit thing for them. Uh, so let's get, so I'm a little, so, so I, I want to put that out there because I think it was worth talking about the idea of, boy, I just don't think we can be so reliant on one thing core thing to build programs and dogs around whether regardless of what we're training them for whether it's the people in the park which were not hunting dogs there wasn't a hunting dog in the group those people in the park are building training off of this idea that we've got to have a place board i see retrieving guys doing it to get dogs to deliver now i think it's a trick that you can use for a little while i did not i thought about using it i talked about using it with a dog and i thought it got quite honestly it became more of a pain in the ass for me than it was than just doing it the way I've done it in the past where we figure out a different way to get the dog to come to the front you know go up against a wall um I it's in our Bella Be Good series you'll see it I talked about it I thought about it and then I went I did it a few times and I don't know that it helped me as much now I'm not against it and I might try it with a younger dog maybe it would have been better if I started earlier I don't know but um I'm not going to hang my hat on one tactic like that. And I see that a lot. I see, I just, I'm starting to see it more and more. So now the idea of what helping when people enter the house, absolutely. Now my dogs, they go on their places very naturally because it's something we've been doing from an early, early part. It's more formal and training, a training tool early on. It's more habitual and lifestyle later on. So like I came in here and my dogs went on their place. So when other people come, if they want to greet that person, it's a very easy way for me to say, no, don't greet the person at the door, get on your place. So then I firm it back up to a command and the dog goes, oh, back to this. Now this is with a dog that's, that I have here that's been on place for a long time. So they get it. They go, oh, I'm back to go, by, go on my spot. So yes, I totally agree. I think it's really nice for that. Um, he talks about his, his approach is sending the dog from a distance, um, expecting them to stay until the commands to retrieve or otherwise get off. Yep, I'm all for that. I think you should have to go get them off early on, not call them. I don't want to get dogs calling off of, off of place because I don't want a habit of them getting slippery and stepping off on their own, anticipating you calling them. It's no different than I don't call them off a of sit. So I don't call them off sit, I don't call them off place early on. Older dogs, I can do it because I think they can understand that the habit has been formed strong enough that the place is the place. I don't come off of here. Sit means sit. I don't get to move. So, but that's that. And what time and how long and how many repetitions and how old does the dog have to be? No answer to any of the above. It depends on the dog. And you got to figure out how to read that as the handler. And you test it and you test it and you find out that all of a sudden you called the dog off to sit a couple times and now it's not sitting st steadily for you. Stop it. Stop calling them off a sit. 
put a couple months on it before you do it again. And then you can figure it out again and, and start to work towards it. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, he said, and then he said something about going duck hunting, you stretch your leg. Yeah, I, I agree. Like I, I, the thing about it is, is I carry enough stuff to the duck blind. I don't want to be carrying uh, place beds. I don't want to have to do that. So that's the reason I wouldn't. But would I, would I get out in the marsh? Would I get out in the field? Would I get out in the woods and do something similar to it? Yeah, because the concept can transfer. Like I said before, you can figure out ways. Hell, I could put a t-shirt down and the dog could be put on place there because that's a perimeter. You got to stay on that bed. You got to stay on that t-shirt. He doesn't know what it is. It's got to be just defined. So um, so the question he says is, I'm very curious about Jeremy and his team, how they use place training at home and in the house. I just kind of talked a lot about that. Um, the, it says that I don't see the dog. It, it doesn't seem like the dogs get to full room of the house. Not at all. You want your dog to get into trouble? Let them free roam the house. So I take away the opportunity to fail, which essentially sets the dog up for success. So that's, that's completely my thought process. Don't put kids in spots that they're going to be tempted to get into trouble. Same thing with the dog. So my dogs don't roam the house. My older dogs have the freedom to, and I would say 85% of the time they choose not to. The reason I allow my older dogs to do it is because I have trust and confidence that they're not going to wreck something. So, um, so that would be the answer to that part of it. Uh, do they occasionally get to romp around the house? So my current pup, he says, 10 weeks old is doing exceptionally well, staying on place for a couple minutes. He's reluctant to force him to stay longer because his perception of attention span. Am I underestimating the potential or is there something else to do with the puppy between kennel time and place time? Well, there's lots of stuff to do between kennel time and place time. I think they're totally different things. Um, yes, there's, you know, you work on stuff. You, you work on recall, you work on heel, you work, you can take dogs for free walks. That's all stuff that you do in between place time and free time or place time and kennel time. But you got to keep in mind that everything you do in that time, sp time period or space is habit forming too. So yeah, you can take dogs for free walks. I think you should. I think you should explore with them. I think they should have an opportunity to become bold and, and use their curiosity to figure things out. But I also don't think that means you put them outside and you just let them run around because as soon as they start getting too far away, they're going to start to develop a range that's too big. If all you do is ever take them out and heal them, they're going to go, I'm not allowed to get out of heel position. I'm dealing with that right now with a 16, 17 month old dog that really, Callie, we're doing the series on, she is becoming much more capable and confident in the idea of getting out from my from the heel position with me so that's taken some time but so i don't want to go extreme one way or the other but i also always am looking at what are the ramifications of whatever it is we're doing right now are we forming a habit if we are which essentially they always are forming habits everything they do is habit forming so make sure everything they do habit forms the right habit and by all means, avoid the wrong ones. So y that answers the, what are we doing in between kennel and place time? All sorts of stuff. Now, the idea at 10 weeks, so here's what I don't like about this. It, you, know, you said he's doing exceptionally well on place for a couple minutes. You're reluctant to force him to stay longer. My question is that force word. You know how I feel about force stuff. I don't think it's necessary most of the time. So. It's a strong word. So maybe I'm reading more into it because it's just a message. Maybe if we were talking about it, we would have used a different word and it would, I'd think about it differently. But right away I start thinking, force it. I don't think you have to force a dog to stay in place. I think you correct it if it comes off and you recognize that, that there are attention span issues and there are antsiness issues and there are ex realistic expectations that you can put on young dogs as far as focus. And if the dog is, I've had 10 week old puppies that could stay on place for hours. I've also had 10 week old puppies that had a really hard time staying on for a minute. And so each one were handled just differently. The dog that was antsy and couldn't get, stay on for a minute, I did my best to have my timing be sharp, my correction be crisp, that the second the dog anticipate, I anticipated that dog stepping off, I gave it the correction. It didn't take a lot of pressure. A simple no, 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 put it back three, four times. And then the dog finally realized if I don't step off, he doesn't correct me. And then I was just as quick to time my praise and say, good boy, 
You did good. That's a learning opportunity. And if you can get the dog to do that for less than a minute, that hadn't done it for a minute, count that as a win, and then tomorrow, I'm gonna go for 45 seconds and see how that goes. And maybe I get a minute out of it. And then once I get a minute out of it, maybe at the end of the minute I go, I think he's gonna fail. So I, before it gets to the point where I anticipate him jumping off, I'm gonna pick him up, put him back in his kennel, and let him think about that for a little bit. And be like, that's a good session, win. And then you slowly add the time to it. You're, you're not taking big bites of this thing, you're taking little nibbles. So at 10, you said something about a couple minutes at 10 weeks, don't base it on the age. I've seen some dogs that are five years old that a couple minutes would be really good and enough. And then we'd build off of it again tomorrow or later in the afternoon. We just slowly add to it. I've seen some dogs that are literally, I've had dogs that shows at 10 weeks old that can stay on them for hours. So it just depends on the dog. It depends on how you've set them up. It depends on how clearly they understand the concept. It depends on their personality and their willingness to be okay with just relaxing and doing nothing. I think it's all cultural. I think we want to speed our dogs up a lot and, and do things quickly in training. And then that means that they think everything that happens in training needs to be fast. I love sessions that we get we maybe do a few things. We did one today. We did a few things, but I would say if you look at the amount of time we spent out there, 50% or less was actually doing anything action-wise. The other 50% was, I had, at one point I called the dog back to me and I just sat there and talked to the camera for five minutes, explaining that what we had just done, so I got value out of that, hopefully value for the viewer. The second value was the dog realized we're hunting and now I gotta sit still and wait and not whine and not fuss and be calm. And she did a great job with it. But that dog has had a culture of nice, slow patience. So I, I just think that that translates to everything you're doing, including place training. So yeah, I, I don't think you should have to force them to do it. I think what you should look at it is slowly and surely, slowly but surely adding some time to it and finding success with it. Because once the concept is there, Part of it is maturing to be able to add that amount of time. And as it gets old, you can't speed that up. You can't speed maturing up. So at 10 weeks old, I'd be real happy. If you had told me 30 minutes, I'd say, I'd be real happy. If you had told me three minutes, I'd have said, I'd be real happy. Like, I think it's real happy. It sounds like you're getting some progress. Positive progress. Keep it moving. Keep it going in that right direction. So, uh, am I, and then I'm just gonna touch quickly. You said, am I underestimating his potential? I think we underestimate all of our dog's potential. Like, I, I think we are always underestimating their potential. What I think we don't do very well is have realistic expectations when it comes to that potential. I see a lot of people that are on one end of the spectrum or the other. My dog's so dumb it won't learn that. That's their attitude. Well, they're right. They're right. The, the, they won't learn that because you're it's not the dog is dumb, it's, I think the dog's got you buffaloed more often than not. So the dog has really figured out how to get you to just let him do what he wants to do. Now the other end of it is the people that think they have the next great one. Like, you see that a lot too. I've seen a lot of dogs. I've seen lots and lots of puppies. I've yet to find the great one. Because I don't know if that even exists. Like it's the Michael Jordans of the dogs. I don't think they exist. I think they all have potential to be very, very good, better than we'll probably ever get out of them. So do we underestimate their potential? Yes. But do we have realistic expectations most of the time? That's the biggest struggle. I'm getting a lot better at it, but it's taken me. First, my son is a freshman in college and he's going to get a puppy this summer of his own. That's when I got my first Labrador. So that would have been 22 years ago. So now, prior to that, I had trained more dogs than he has trained. He hasn't trained any yet. So he's never had that real like need to have his own dog. He's never felt that way. He's got it now and I'm real happy about it. 
So, but prior to him, prior to that, prior to me at 19 years old, I had worked with a bunch of golden retrievers and they didn't, weren't that good. Um, I thought they were great, quite honestly. And, and each one was a little bit better, but they weren't that good, but I, neither was I. They were good. They were, they were, they did what we needed them to do from a hunting standpoint and a family dog standpoint. But I, you know, I wasn't a trainer back then. I, at 19 is when it first hit me. It was 22 years ago. I'm just, I, I can say that I'm getting better at it. I'm getting a lot better at understanding it. I'm getting a lot better at figuring it out. Um, probably having the realistic expectations that I should. It came from 22 years and a bunch of dogs. And I'm not even that great at it yet. So I think it, and I think, and I think I can do some really good things with dogs. I think I can really turn out nice dogs. Um, I think if, if, if you talked with folks that I've trained dogs for, I think they would say that. So if you're listening to this and you're going, am I under, you know, it, it, do I have realistic expectations? You probably don't. And you probably shouldn't unless you've been doing it for a really, really long time and you trained a lot of dogs. And even if you have, I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but I'm going to be the one to tell you, you're not as good as you think you are, probably. I'm not. And I don't even think I'm that good. So you, let's, uh, some humility and humbleness is important when it comes to this. And so, Ben, I'm going to tell you right now, you got, it sounds like you've got a really good start on things. You should be confident in what you're doing. But I also want to be honest with you and say, you got a long way to go. And I don't say it to be a jerk. I say it to be honest. And I think if you're okay with hearing that and going, he's right. I got a really good start, but I got a long way to go. I think you will, in the end, will get so much more out of what you're doing with the dog and the dogs will get a lot more out of it as well. So Ben can be any one of you guys listening because it's probably a very similar story. So I, I just want, I want it, that gets a little deeper than the idea of place training. But at the same time, you know, I think we got to keep that stuff in mind. I think it's important. So that's it. Ben's got class here in five minutes. I got to cut this off and then we're going to, we're going to probably record a few this afternoon. Huh? So we're going to be giving you guys some more podcasts. We've got some exciting news here at Dogbone headquarters. Uh, we'll be announcing it pretty soon. Um, I want to thank you guys again for supporting what we're doing here. I appreciate it greatly. Um, if you would do us the favor, share this with anyone you think it might help. Leave us a review. If you're on Apple or you're on Android or you're on whatever podcast thing you're listening to it, if, you, if there's an option to do it, I know they don't all have reviews, but if there is, if you could leave a review, um, I probably got to dig into outside. I listen to Apple, so that's where I get my pods, but I probably got to dig outside of that and see where how you can read the reviews on your other podcast apps. Um, because I, 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 I have read some for a while. I couldn't, and it really pissed me off. So Ben fixed it for me. I really want to read them, and it's not to just make myself feel good. I really do appreciate a lot of the nice things that people say, and it does feel good. But I also... I don't mind reading, I wish this. Someone at one point, we've got a lot of people that like our intro music, like the song, but they said it was too loud. So we adjusted it. That was a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. So little things like that, I go, well, I don't know that because I don't necessarily listen to it the way you guys do. So keep us updated on that. Keep sharing. Uh, keep giving us feedback. And thank you for the support. I really appreciate it.